Quite simply a matter of fact, vaccines work. Vaccines save lives. They prevent illness, misery and hardship. You've heard all of the numbers from Dr. Bonner and Dr. Kelleher, and they're dramatic. Measles, in 1959, there were over 15,000 cases. In the 1970s, not that long ago, there were seven deaths a year from measles on average. And last year, as you heard, there were 43 cases, but that should have been zero. Diphtheria, pertussis, polio, the numbers all tell the same story, and I'm not going to focus on numbers. I want to try to give you the real picture, the real impact. And when I think about the impact of vaccines on lives, I don't have to look very far to think about what happens when we didn't have vaccines. If I think of my own family, if I go back to the 1940s, just before the initiation of vaccine programs, my uncle, who was then four years of age, died of diphtheria. My grandfather, just shortly thereafter, succumbed to oropharyngeal cancer. That would now be preventable, most likely. In the 1950s, one of my generation, at six months of age, was taken from the family in the midst of panic, driven from the country to Dublin, into Cherry Orchard Hospital with polio, where they lay isolated for over six months. And I recall going to Kappa Hospital in the probably the 60s and visiting and seeing the children that had been in that ward in Cherry Orchard alongside me. And they were in calipers, in wheelchairs, and the wards were filled, the results of the polio epidemic. In the 1960s, we all went through the series of measles, mumps, whooping cough, you name it. I remember them all. And we were the lucky ones because we recovered. But there are many out there today who have chronic lung disease or blindness, and there were those who didn't survive. In the 1980s, we move on to the next generation. My daughter almost died from Haemophilus influenza sepsis. Her playmate was in the ICU with meningitis. And now to today, this morning, I left my home and my two-year-old grandchild was running around visiting. He is two, and I am delighted that he has had all these vaccines and that I don't have to worry about those diseases for him anymore. He has also had Men B vaccine, and he is lucky, because this week, and I'm working in Temple Street in Crumlin, I left the bedside of a two-year, four-month-old who is fighting for his life having had men be meningitis, because he wasn't lucky enough to be born in the era of the national campaign. We didn't have funding for a catch-up campaign. This is the real impact of vaccinations. And when misinformation spreads, it denies people the benefits of those vaccines. So it results in real individual tragedy for families, but it also results in community tragedy. There has been a lot of misinformation about vaccines. Of course, we acknowledge that there is no medicine, no therapy that is 100% safe, nor is there a vaccine that is 100% safe for every person. But you know, it wasn't 100% safe leaving my house, getting in my car, and driving here today. But on a balancing of risks, the benefits of vaccine at the individual level and at the community level far outweigh those risks. But of course, it is important that we have close surveillance to pick up any adverse events that might happen. The history of vaccines is not without its problems, and we acknowledge that. But we now have very careful pre-licensure, post-licensure monitoring to detect any signals that might say there's a problem. And when problems arise, and I suppose in this country, in this community, we can't you know, shy away from them that, for example, we have the problem of narcolepsy related to the pandemic flu vaccine. <coughs> it is investigated, it is acknowledged, and then uh, appropriate actions are taken. If we contrast that with, for example, with the current scares around the HPV vaccine, those concerns have been heard. And I have seen patients with this constellation of symptoms in my clinic, and it is a problem for the family. We don't deny that. These are very real issues when you have a son or daughter who 
you saw was achieving and performing very well, and suddenly it seems that the rug has been pulled from under them because they are no longer able to go to school, they're tired, they've muscles aches, they've pains. We don't understand all that complex of symptoms. Those symptoms were there before the HPV vaccine. They're there in girls who are vaccinated. They are there in girls who are unvaccinated. They are there in boys. And the EMAA, though when that concern arose, they looked at it and the uh, Vigilance Committee in the EMA looked at what was that incidence in vaccinated and what was that incidence in the unvaccinated, and there was no difference. Contrast that with narcolepsy. When they looked at it, there was a higher incidence in the vaccinated. The background incidence had stayed the same. So that is the difference between these two things. So we can be reassured that these symptoms, although they may temporarily occur in relationship to the vaccines, are not causally related. And what we may find, as Colette has alluded to, that we are, we, children are missing out on the vaccines and will later suffer the impact in terms of cervical cancers and other cancers, as Donal can expand on later. So, I put to you that our vaccine, our national immunization program have got safe and effective vaccines that are benefiting our community. That we have to shatter the myths around vaccine, the myths that diseases are extinct or no longer a threat, the myths such as happened with the MMR that vaccines cause autism, the myth that HPV vaccine causes chronic fatigue syndrome or POTS, the postural orthostatic hypotension syndrome. And we have to communicate and we have to learn how to do it better, that these vaccines are safe. And in fact, what we really need to look at is how we can expand our vaccination campaign so that we can protect the lives and health of others. We need to look, for example, as to how we can make sure that no other two-year-old comes in to our clinic with meningococcal meningi men B um, infection when we know we have a vaccine that is very effective. They introduced it in the UK, our close neighbour, ahead of us. And they've just published the data of the effectiveness of the first six months of the campaign and the number of cases had already halved ten months after its introduction. We have to look at why we aren't using varicella, chickenpox vaccine, in this country. People have a wrong idea about chickenpox. They think it is a simple, uncomplicated illness. Just this week, I've tended four children hospitalized with serious complications of chickenpox. They are, when they get chickenpox, they are vulnerable not only to its complications, but the complications of serious invasive bacterial disease. And at the moment, we have very invasive, nasty streptococcal disease that is causing bone infections, skin infections. It was caused the flesh-eating bug in the papers. And we have seen that in children who've had chickenpox. Four children this, this week, two with bone infections, one with complicated seizures. And there is an effective, safe, licensed vaccine. I have to ask, why aren't we using it in our program? We would certainly like to. So we need to make sure that we strengthen our program and that we expand it to benefit our community, both by health, but also, as Dr. Callagher said, the economic costs. Thankfully, we've introduced rotavirus vaccine. That will make a di big difference to families and to workplaces and to the country's economy. So thank you for inviting us here today. And understand that all of us here are physicians. None of us want to do any harm to any of our patients. We would not give vaccines if we did not truly believe they were safe. But certainly, my girls were among the first before the vaccine was introduced to the national program that I gave them that vaccine because I had looked at the data. I knew it was safe. And I did not want to see my daughter, who now has one child expecting her second, succumb to cervical cancer maybe in her 30s or 40s when the children are still young. And yet, I know someone who is in that very position today as we sit here debating the merits. So thank you. Thank you very much.